Today we're going to look at some really interesting research that's become available from the University of Illinois. Scientists for a very long time have tried to figure out just how to understand the structure of the brain and how that structure of the brain relates to intelligence. Is intelligence something that is derived from some particular part of the brain, or is it something else? For a very long time, scientists have believed that there were certain areas of the brain that really defined and were the source of intelligence. There were a number of different theories about where this came from. A common idea around this was that this kind of generalized intelligence really was a result of the function of the prefrontal cortex. So the, the front part of the brain, sort of back behind the eyes. More recent theories emphasized more specific areas of the brain and the networks they formed between this area and that area. In this, researchers were particularly focused on processes such as planning and problem solving, decision making, and then where did those particular functions arise from in the brain and how did those interconnect with other areas doing other specific functions. So in this study, published in the journal Human Brain Mapping, they used what is called connectome-based predictive modeling to compare five different theories about how the brain works and how it gives rise to intelligence. The first author on this study is Evan Anderson, who is a researcher for Ball Aerospace. He is currently working at the Air Force Research Laboratory and working in conjunction with the University of Illinois. In this research, they're working to understand the cognitive abilities that the uh, intelligence is made up of by looking at the biological foundations in the brain. Modern theories work to explain how our capacity is enabled and involved in the brain's information processing structure. So that's what they're looking at. What's the structure of the brain and how does that architecture, how does that interplay or give a rise to intelligence? The theory that these particular researchers were sort of betting on is what they call the network neuroscience theory, which maintains that intelligence comes out of the global architecture of the brain, and that includes both strong and weak connections in the brain, rather than in certain areas of the brain that drive those functions, that it's the whole network of the brain that is important. So when they're talking about strong connections, these involve really highly connected hubs of information processing that are established when we learn about the world and become good at problem solving and dealing with repetitive things, familiar things over and over. Weak connections are these connections that have fewer neural linkages, but they let the brain have a level of flexibility and are able to sort of promote an adaptive response to problem solving. And then together, they would say these provide the network architecture that is necessary for solving diverse problems that we encounter in life. But to test these various theories, one against the other, they took about 300 undergrad students and they started out with having each of them do a very comprehensive set of tests designed to measure the problem-solving skills and the adaptive capabilities that each of these students had in various contexts. And these and similar diverse tests are often used to measure general intelligence. The next thing that they did is they did resting functional MRIs of each of the participants. 
And they said of this to quote, one of the really interesting properties of the human brain is how it embodies a rich constellation of networks that are active even when we're at rest. These networks create the biological infrastructure of the mind and are thought to be intrinsic properties of the brain. Now, for some of you, this may sound a little technical, but stay with us. It's interesting. So these areas of the brain include the frontal parietal network, which lets the cognitive control take place and lets us have goal-directed decision-making. And then the dorsal attention network, which aids in and gives rise to visual and spatial awareness, and the salience network, which directs attention to whatever is the most relevant stimuli in a given situation. So they were then able to put together these uh, cognitive tests and the functional MRIs. And then they came to say, and again we quote, we have systematically investigated how well a theory predicts general intelligence based on the connectivity of brain regions or networks that theory entails. This approach, they continue, allowed us to directly compare evidence for the neuroscience prediction made by current theories. What these researchers found was that the best way to predict what somebody's general intelligence is, is to take into account the whole of the brain function, the whole network of the brain, rather than the function of specific areas. Other theories also had some predictive value, but the network neuroscience theory outperformed all of those by quite a large degree. The findings reveal that, and again we quote, global information processing in the brain is fundamental to how well an individual overcomes cognitive challenges. And to continue to quote, they said, rather than originate from a specific region or network, intelligence appears to emerge from the global architecture of the brain and to reflect the efficiency and flexibility of system-wide network function. Well, the reason we bring this up is because we here at Learn to Learn have very much taken this view for quite some time. It's one of the reasons that we promoted some of the work of Wynne Wurgen in his book, The Einstein Factor. And we did a whole podcast on that that's coming up. That podcast is called Learning to Increase Intelligence. And in his work, he developed several ways to increase the capacity of the entire network. One of the things that he did was something called image streaming that we'll go into in great depth in that upcoming podcast. And in that, he would take two parts of the brain. In the original research, he took the visual cortex and the auditory centers and, in a sense, forced those to interact through processes of visualization and vocalization and found that they got dramatic increases in IQ. In the studies that were done, the increases were measured to be anywhere from 20 to 40 points increase in IQ. This kind of increase in IQ at one time was unimaginable. IQ was thought to be totally fixed, but he and using other approaches have been able to devise ways to increase intelligence. So what Wynn pointed out was if we took these two areas of the brain and we made them interact through this uh, process that he developed, that we got this kind of increase. But he was also quick to say that if we took any two areas of the brain and cause them to interact in a sustained way, that that would also produce another kind of increase in intelligence. It would develop another quality, another capacity of intelligence, and that that could be done numerous ways. 
It didn't have to involve just our visual and auditory faculties. It could involve, let's say, our visual and kinesthetic faculties, or on and on. So those are ways to develop the entirety of the network and build that interconnectedness throughout the brain, which we offer this research up to you connected to this methodology so that you can consider how you might develop your own neural network and how you too can increase your native intelligence. If we increase our IQ by 40 points, that can take us from being fairly average to into the beginning of genius range. So this is no small thing, and it is available to you.